Let's go ahead and have a seat. We're going to get started. So I want to thank everyone for coming uh, to our residence day. Uh, Dr. Olson usually is here um, to give a very eloquent welcome, and instead you're stuck with me. Uh, I'm Bob Hoffman. For those of you who don't know, I'm one of the pediatric ophthalmologists here. Dr. Crandall and I are the co-chairs of this meeting. Actually, Elaine does all the work. We just get credit for it. Um, Dr. Olson did ask me to extend a welcome to everyone. We're grateful that you've come to uh, support this day. The major focus of the day is for the residents to present their research. And the other thing that we have here is we have our distinguished alumni, Dr. Dollywall, and she will be both uh, providing insight, hopefully into the Grand Rounds patients, which we're gonna start with, and then she'll be more formally introduced uh, uh, later uh, before her uh, address. I understand she gave a wonderful talk last night. My apologies for not being there. Um, and um, I need somebody responsible for each of the Grand Round patients to come up and present them very briefly. Then we're gonna give her a chance to comment and then we can get other comments as time allows. And um, before I forget, I also want to thank all of the vendors who came to help support this meeting in terms of uh, providing uh, breakfast breaks. Um, and uh, there is CME available. Make sure you sign in at the desk. So who's? All right. Dr. Jordan. All right, I'm Adam Jorgensen, one of the chief residents. I'm gonna present our first case uh, from this morning. Um, so, uh, our patient this morning was a 56-year-old female, works as a realtor, and overall pretty healthy. Has asthma and seasonal allergies, uh, some allergic conjunctivitis occasionally, but other than that, no, no prior eye surgeries. Has a mom with macular degeneration. And her story started back in 2006 when she presented for a refractive surgery screening. And at that screening, she had, a, she had great corrected visual acuity and normal uh, intraocular pressure, but she was noted to have an iris lesion and uh, a little bit abnormal uh, pupil shape. And so she was referred for an ocular ultrasound, which showed an iris cyst uh, with the dimensions there. And then just kind of a follow-up ultrasound was done a year and a half later that showed it was basically unchanged and also that there were multiple smaller uh, adjacent iris cysts. She, over the course of several years, had multiple serial ultrasounds every six months or so that really showed no change in the size of that large iris cyst. In the meantime, though, she was seen in September 2008 for worsening vision, and she was found to have uh, cystoid macular edema in that right eye. And so she was referred to the uveitis service, uh, where she got a, a pretty extensive lab workup and chest x-ray, which was all normal, and she was thought to likely have a, an old branch retinal vein occlusion. Actually, by the time she had been seen in the uveitis clinic, she had been treated with NSAIDs and her, her edema had resolved. Her vision was back to 20-20. Um, and uh, so she was, she was followed in the uveitis clinic uh, every now and then to, to make sure the edema wasn't coming back. And then in 2013, uh, she came back saying that her vision was worse in the right eye. And uh, there was this abnormal corneal appearance, and it, that had been noted before that she kind of had this beaten metal corneal uh, appearance. So she was worked up at that point with a pentacam, uh, which showed some asymmetric pachymetry, uh, specular microscopy, which showed decreased uh, endothelial cell density in the right eye. And she was evaluated gonioscopically, which showed pretty significant uh, peripheral anterior synechia in the right eye, but the left eye was wide open. This, picture, I apologize, didn't come across very well, but you can kind of see the general morphology of the cornea. <coughs> and uh, some slit lamp photos. Um, 
This one, you can see this demonstrates the correctopia. And inferiorly, <clears throat> you can appreciate that the, the angle is more shallow. And that's where that uh, iris cyst is. There's another picture if you look uh, temporally there. There's my pointer here. Uh, so there's kind of the larger iris cyst, which is a little bit difficult to appreciate. It's, it was deeper and really seen just on the ultrasound. But uh, then there were these other smaller iris cysts, um, correctopia and ectropia and UVA. Um, kind of on uh, uh, looking at the cornea, uh, it's hard to appreciate blown up like this, but you could, you could see this uh, kind of distinct endothelial appearance, the beaten metal look. And then uh, there's a slit lamp photo through the cornea where you can see some kind of speckle, speckles of some stromal uh, haze and scarring. So um, <clears throat> at this point, uh, residents, any ideas of what we're looking at in this unilateral process? At least a, maybe some differential considerations. Good, good. That's a great uh, assessment. Uh, and how about specific types of ice syndrome? Is there one that you might uh, think about? Uh, thinking about the three classic types of ice syndrome, which one would you classify this as? Kogan Reese, Kogan -Reese uh, also known as uh, diffuse iris nevus syndrome. Good, so that was the presumptive diagnosis given to her at the time. She was followed uh, by the glaucoma service at that point where her visual acuity initially and intraocular pressure were normal and stable. And for a couple of years, up until recently, there was no evidence of glaucoma. Uh, but then September of last year, she was seen again. Her pressure in the right eye was up to 26. Uh, she had recently completed some steroids for asthma. And so it was thought maybe this was a pressure response, even though it was kind of asymmetric. She was started on latanoprost at that point. And every visit after that, her pressure was a, right around the 22 to 23 range. Uh, but she still had full visual fields and normal uh, retinal nerve fiber layer OCT. Uh, then here two weeks ago, she was seen again, and her pressure was up again to 28 in that right eye. Uh, gonioscopically, she was noted to have uh, new areas of, of uh, PAS superiorly, and the inferior PAS was, known, was noted to be spreading uh, temporally. So she was started on uh, another pressure-lowering drop, <coughs> dorazolamide. Um, when she was seen today, this morning, her pressure was rechecked and it was 22. Very quick review. Um, we do think this is ICE syndrome. This is where endothelial cells get replaced by abnormal, kind of migratory, more epithelial type cells. Uh, these migrate over the trabecular meshwork and contract and, and lead to progressive angle closure. And there's these three subtypes, of which we think this one's probably Kogan Reese or Iris Nevis syndrome, where you get multiple small pedunculated nodules on the iris surface. <coughs> um, so the points we wanted to kind of discuss in her case, uh, first of all, it was kind of interesting she had this the cystoid macular edema. Um, I was able to find one case report of this, of CME associated just with ice syndrome. Um, but I was wondering if, if our retina or uveitis specialists have seen this before. And also, uh, when's the right time to intervene on this patient who has contraindications to beta blockers and is, is essentially maxed out on her, her drops at this point, but doesn't have clinical glaucoma yet, when is the right time to intervene and what's, what's the correct intervention, what's most likely to work in a progressive uh, uh, case like this? So I'll turn that over for discussion. Any Good morning, everyone. It's a super awesome pleasure to be here. I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be back. Uh, and, in, you know, I'm a cornea specialist, so <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the glaucoma with Alan Crandall in the room. But 
I, I do want to say that uh, the corneal edema in this patient uh, was not, it's not clinically significant yet. And I talked about this yesterday, but how do you know when a patient's endothelium is really pooping out? You know, when is it time to do, to do some intervention like a DMEC? The question that I ask, or in a patient that has Fuchs and cataract, how do you know when you have to do a corneal transplant with the cataract surgery, or when can you just get away with the cataract surgery alone? I ask one very simple question, and that is, when you first wake up in the morning, is your vision more cloudy or hazy first thing in the morning, and then gradually does it clear with time? So if they say yes, they wake up and they have 45 minutes of cloudy, hazy vision that then clears, I know their endothelium is decompensating. Then I will do a combined surgery on that patient. Or if it was a patient like this, I would start you know, seriously thinking about at least using Muro ointment at night to help the, the endothelial cells function. So in patients that have this type of corneal decompensation, we first start with conservative therapy. We'll have them use Muro ointment at night, and that doesn't sting. So they put it in at night, they wake up. In the morning, they can do various things. If they use Muro drops, it should be one drop of the Muro, Q five minutes times three. That's the you know, dosing that we use to really get the tears more hypertonic to draw out the water, okay? Because it's salt and you want to make you know, the tears hypertonic. So, so that's important in terms of just managing the patient. So they can do the Miro drops, and a lot of patients, you know, they'll do the ointment at night, they wake up, then they'll do the drops. They might do even you know, a, a series of those drops, maybe every hour, just in the, in the beginning, in the morning, and, and get through their day. You know, we talked about a hair dryer, and, and I do have a patient that loves to kind of blow dry her hair and then her eyeball, and, and you know, it's very efficient. Um, <laughs> but that can work as well. Anything to kind of deter just the cornea so they can function later, later in the day. <clears throat> in terms of, um, so for her, if she needed then, you know, after medical therapy, then you would have to do surgical therapy. And in this case, she's phagic. Uh, she would be a really good candidate for DMEC. Uh, however, in ICE syndrome patients, you know, these graphs don't do well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, this is a really, really challenging uh, condition. And it's, you know, generally a progressive situation. So these endothelial cells have epithelial characteristics. They're migrating, they're causing these problems, you know, all this stuff. So it doesn't halt the progression of the disease. So these eyes generally do not do very well with transplantation, but we do our best, right? What are you gonna do? So, um, so you know, the procedure that I would recommend for her when her cornea is really decompensated would be a DMEC. Now, in terms of medical management of her glaucoma, the ideal thing would be to stay away from carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because the, those, that class of medication also affects endothelial pump function. So ideally, you know, in her, it's a little challenging because the beta blockers exacerbated her asthma. And, you know, even the latanopro, she has a history of CME, and I know Barbara was, you know, on that. She said, well, it's a risk-benefit ratio, right? You have to think about every drop you're giving this patient and how it's going to affect her either systemically or the rest of her eye. Um, but ideally, we like to stay away from the, from the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors for pressure control um, in, this, in this class of patients. So that's, that's my two, those are my two cents. Anybody else want to? Jump in for the glaucoma management. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. So obviously this is a patient that I've been sharing in management um, with some of my other glaucoma colleagues, and I completely agree. It's a risk benefit. And I hesitated on the true sopt. She has a history of allergies. I was more worried about the alpha again. I could switch her over. Um, she's been stable visual acuity-wise, even on the prostaglandins now for several years. 
I agree with you. I did not like the idea of putting her on a CAI, but I thought, you know, okay, she's sitting at 28. At one point, I think she even creeped up into the low 30s. Um, any role for doing serial um, endothelial cell counts in her, or would you really just use the, okay, is your vision blurry? And that was a conversation we had with her this morning. Since she started this, you know, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, are you noticing any blurred vision? And she hasn't. That's correct. So. You're, you're all going to have to pardon my voice today. It's still a little... Uh low from my surgery the other day. but So the, the eye syndrome is really interesting. You know, we know the histopathology, but we really, really don't understand the mechanism. So one of the things that's most interesting is why is it almost always women, and why is it almost always all, all, only one side? There are case reports of two sides, but that's very unusual. The presumptive original reason was abnormal endothelial cells. That was the theory behind certainly the corneal aspect, and, and, but doesn't make sense with the iris nevus. So they've been now clumped into one syndrome, and most people think that there's some one hist immunohistopathology that has something to do with kicking it off. And others think that these, these are ne neural nest cells that were at present at birth and somehow been activated by viruses or by some other mechanism, but it's an unusual one. And like you talked yesterday about RK being the gift that keeps on giving for cornea specialists, this is a gift that keeps on giving for ophthalmologists or glaucoma guys, because you rarely can get away with one, and you're basically buying time with each of the procedures until something better comes up. Um, certainly at this point, I would, by the other way, the other thing is they're almost always missed for the first five or six times they get seen. Almost always. It's not an easy diagnosis unless they show up with super classical <laughs> presentations. The youngest I've ever seen was a 12-year-old, and uh, the oldest in our, in our original series was like 80 before the diagnosis. It was a pretty big range. So um, I'd like to hear uh, is... I think, I hope somebody from retina, uh, one of the uveitis, would, could talk about that possible immunohistochemical aspect of it. And I, would, I know Craig and I slightly disagree with this he, it be on management at this point. If it comes to surgical, I would, I would do an express shunt because it, it keeps the, the tube and the shunt have two advantages over traps. There's, it's hard for the cells to climb into them, but the problem with the the, tr the tube, from my standpoint, although it's, a, it's an advantage uh, lifestyle-wise, but they almost always are never off drops, and the corneas in these people take a beating over time, and that becomes a, a true problem in this area. So I, I think, and that takes up a lot of space if you do a, a tube. That's my only, I just, so Craig, you want to give your present? <laughs> Just regarding her medical management, uh, we talked about CAIs causing corneal edema, but I've actually had maybe a half a dozen cases of corneal edema from prostaglandins as well. So I think just about everything that we're going to use on her has some sort of risk. Uh, I didn't get the lens status for her. Is, her, is she totally clear lens? She's clear. She's totally clear. So in terms of, I personally would probably put in a tube, um, and I think we actually have some real estate that we forget about, and with some of our new tube shunts, we can put those inferiorly. So um, for cosmesis or for just more real estate, we can either go uh, infranasal or supertemporal. Uh, those would be kind of my first two choices for a tube shunt. And they can hide pretty well. Uh, and the tube can also be placed in the sulcus to keep it away from the cornea, uh, although that's a little bit trickier when a patient's phacic. Um, but it can be done. So if there was risk for corneal decompensation or if she ended up having a graft or something and we wanted to keep the tube away from the graft, uh, we could reroute that tube. So I think that's one of the advantages if you have a tube uh, is that it's less likely to get clogged, but you can also reroute it if necessary. Uh, but this is a difficult case. I would probably wait until the absolute last minute. Uh, I would not put a tube initially just because she can't uh, tolerate the medications yet. And you know, some considerations for other things later if she needed surgery would be ECP. Uh, that doesn't require any devices. Uh, it's an inflow procedure and that may also help her. But I think we have to treat this as presumptive. Although it looks open right now, essentially it's going to be angle closure. Yeah, sure, yeah. And so that would be my philosophy. Okay, thanks. 
I just just one thought. I, I, I don't tend to be much of a, of a fatalist, but with this disease, I completely am. You know, I've got these eyes just over time just do not do well. So as far as the surgical approach, I, you know, I totally agree. I would wait until you absolutely felt like you had to do something. And then anything you do, you know it's going to fail. And I think it's important to tell the patient that right up, up front. I mean, this is going to be the first of multiple surgeries. And so for me personally in these patients, I start with a TRAB, and then I try to revise that TRAB, which you inevitably will have to do. And then I do a second TRAB and revise that one, and then finally go to tubes. And you know, I mean, Alan's got more years on me, but you know, I've got patients like this with eye syndrome that uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that I've been following for 25 years, you know, and uh, I've operated on them five or six times to, over that period of, of 25 years to just try to keep their glaucoma under control. I mean, it really is just this relentless process that uh, you keep trying to fight back for as long as you can. Thank goodness it's almost always just in one eye, and uh, you've got that going for you. And that's another thing that I think you need to reassure your patients about right off is to tell them that in almost all instances, this is just going to be a one-eyed problem, which in, in this setting is, is a real blessing. So.